What's up, Pastor Joey here. Thanks so much for checking out this message today. Our church is in a season called Brick Layers, where we are studying the book of Nehemiah to uncover the truths that people who build great things know. Our prayer is that this message would equip you to join Jesus in building something great through your life. You're not gonna wanna miss a single moment of this season, so make sure to hit that subscribe button to help you become the brick layer that God has built you to be. Hope you enjoy. I wanna formally welcome you to Vision Season at Elevate City Church. Today is gonna be epic. Today is gonna be massive for each and every one of us. I believe that God wants to do something so significant in you, so special in you, so rich in you, so real in you, so new in you. And I believe that he wants to start it today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray together and just invite God's spirit into this space. Jesus, we need you. We need you to speak to us and to open our eyes. We need, to, we need you to give us a heart for this world, a heart for people. God, we're asking that you would expand our territory, God, that you would expand our faith, that you would increase our boldness, and that you'd give us the heart to be people who have lives that are centered on your name. This church isn't known for our songs and it's not known for our sermons, but it's known for being obsessed with the God of the universe whose name is Jesus. Jesus, I just pray today that there are some doubters, that there are some skeptics, that there are some lost people who would get found, that there are some dead people who you would make alive, that there are some broken people that you'd start to make whole, that there are some complacent people that you'd move to action, that there's some people who are on the outside that you'd bring on the inside to be a part of your family, to do something special and to be a part of change in the world. And we pray it for your name and for your renown and all God's people said, amen and amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be a part of a church that believes that the best is yet to come, amen. I'm excited to be a part of a church that isn't on the verge of putting up a for sale sign, but that is on the verge of breakthrough in a city that believes that God is still building his church, that we ain't seen nothing yet. Turn to your neighbor and say, you ain't seen nothing yet. Say, especially if it's your first time, because that dude's crazy up there. I really believe that you guys haven't seen anything yet, that together as a people, that we haven't seen anything yet. Today, we're kicking off our vision series titled Brick Layers. Let me hear you say Brick Layers. And we're going to be studying through the book of Nehemiah, the true historical biblical story for the next eight weeks. And I believe that the book of Nehemiah is going to help us see who God wants us to be in this next season as a church. I believe that the book of Nehemiah is going to set us on fire for building a kingdom culture. Come on, I'm going to put this up here. Building a kingdom culture brick by brick. Let's say that part together. Brick by brick. I want for you to turn to your neighbor and say, you a brick? It's, the, it's like the least encouraging statement you've ever said to your neighbor, right? Now turn back to them and say, you a brick house. You know, somebody calling you a brick isn't extremely encouraging. And that's because a brick all by itself is nothing more than a paperweight, yeah? Actually, a brick by itself is usually used for danger. It's used for vandalism it's thrown through windows it's used to hurt people brick all by itself is nothing more than a paperweight but bricks connected together are used to build something special and my hope and my heart is that throughout this series that you and I would get a vision for our lives where we see that by ourselves as individuals we're nothing more than bricks but placed in the hands of the master builder. We are being used by God to build something way bigger than ourselves, amen? Something that was being built before we got here that will continue to be built long after we're gone and dare I say is the only thing that will be standing in the end and that's the church of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. It is a house that even the gates of hell cannot stand against, amen? And you and I get to join Jesus in this story of building his church. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a brick. You're a brick. Brick by brick. It really means person by person, story by story, step by step, that we get to see God do something that we could never see him do without him stepping into the situation. 
You know, I'm so glad that Nehemiah is one of those bricks, that Nehemiah is one of those stories, one of those people that God used to build something that matters, something that lasts. You know, Nehemiah, Nehemiah was a nobody. Nehemiah wasn't a business, he, he, he wasn't anybody in business, he wasn't a leader in business, he wasn't a leader in politics, shoot, he wasn't even a leader in the church, all right? Like, Nehemiah wasn't even verified on Instagram, y'all, okay? He was a nobody. Nobody knew Nehemiah. But God took this man, this surrendered man, to do something special. All Nehemiah was, was a servant. But don't you know that servants always get the front row seats to see the miracle, amen? That people with a heart of service, the people with a posture of giving, the people who are willing to serve always get the front row seats to see the miracle. Let me help you step into history for a second. For the last 70 years, the Hebrew people have lived in exile. They live in a land that is not their own. They are displaced from their nation and they have no honor within the world. Nehemiah was actually born in exile. He was born in captivity. From a timeline perspective, this story, Nehemiah, is written simultaneously with the books of Esther and Ezra telling a collective story of the way that from multiple vantage points, from a multiplicity of angles, God is always working to build his kingdom. And don't you know that you and I Usually we just see what's going on right in front of us. And what you need to recognize today is that all around us, and if need so, despite us, God is working to build his church, amen? That he is doing it from so many angles in so many parts of the world. And Nehemiah is a part of that story. Where we pick up the story, we are in the Persian city of Susa, where Nehemiah, who was born in exile, has worked his way up to be a cupbearer to the king. And so he is serving the king in terms of what's happened on the world stage for the last 70 years. The powers of the world stage has shifted from Babylon, who overthrew Israel, to Persia, who God is now going to use to restore Israel. There's this little side note. It is important for the church to understand that the way that we make disciples for people who are coming out of exile to go and rebuild the kingdom is much different than the way that we make disciples in the promised land. Amen. A lot of times the church is acting like we're still living in the promised land when the truth is that we're in exile. And the way that you make disciples in exile is you make disciples who've got deep faith, not shallow faith. You make disciples who are contributors, not consumers. You make disciples who are all in, not halfway in. You make disciples who are God-centered, not self-centered. And that's the kind of discipleship-driven church that Elevate City is. We're after building some ballin' Jesus followers in Jesus' name. We're not looking for any JV Christians around here. We want to see you own your faith, be set on fire in your faith, be equipped to engage your faith. You see, a lot of us have lived in kindergarten Christianity for too, far too long. You know what's really cute when you're a kid? The kiddie pool, right? There is nothing more cute than a kid splashing around in a kiddie pool. All right, I got a daughter, I got a son, I got another one on the way. Hello, I've been up to some business, y'all, okay? And it is so cute watching a kid in the kiddie pool, watching her splash around and learn how to swim. It is so fun. Do you know what is awkward as all get out? A grown man sitting in the kiddie pool. Like, I want for you to imagine this with me for a second. You go to your neighborhood pool this afternoon and you walk and there's a 45-year-old grown hairy chest man with a big old burly beard with some floaties on, flapping around in the kiddie pool, having the time of his life. What do you do in that moment? You call the cops, okay? You're like, somebody get here as soon as possible. This is not okay. And the truth is, is that far too many of us are that 45-year-old man splashing around in the kiddie pool of Christianity. We're in the exact same place in our relationship with God that we were 20 years ago. And I'm here to tell you today that we're no longer in the promised land. We're in exile, and it's time for some disciple-making machines to emerge. And so if you're not being discipled or you're not making disciples, be at base camp. Let me hear you say base camp. Base camp. And all of that was free, okay? But back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah tells us the story of the third and final return of the Hebrew people to Jerusalem out of exile to rebuild the city walls and restore the gates that had been destroyed by Babylon invasion 70 years prior. The city is in ruins. 
There are no jobs. There's no structure. There's no educational system. There is no business. There is no hope. And that's the backdrop for the book of Nehemiah. If you have your Bibles, Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to pick it up in verse 1. I'm going to ask you, can you stand? Can we stand together as we read God's word today? Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. This is what the word of God says. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I want to preach a message for you today titled, When a Heart Breaks. When a Heart Breaks breaks. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Now, by show of hands, when I said when a heart breaks, how many of you saying in your head, it don't break even? It don't break even. Like, what am I supposed to do? Y'all don't know that song when the best part of me is always you? What am I supposed to say? All right, you guys got to live a little, okay? We have the least cultured church on the planet right now, all right? But you're welcome because now that song will be in your head the rest of the day. When a heart breaks. How many of you have ever experienced heartbreak before? How many of you have ever just had your heart crushed? Okay, I, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up and I could fall in love so easy, okay? So quick I could fall in love. I would, so quick, I would find a girl and I would be like, Jack, I'll never let go. I'll never let go. But then she would like let go of me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll never forget it when I was in the second grade. And in the second grade, I fell in love, y'all. Okay, I walked into Mr. Floystad's second grade classroom and there she was, Samantha Ritter, all right? And it's like when I saw Samantha Ritter, it was like that moment in a movie where time stops. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Any hopeless romantics in the house today? I lived this out, like the time stops. I swear to God, like music started playing over the loudspeakers of the school. Okay, birds were landing on her shoulder. She started levitating. Mr. Floystad was popping bottles of Cristal in the background, right? It was a wild moment. And I fell in love in an instant. And then a couple months later, Samantha Ritter told me that she was moving to Nebraska, and I was like, fine, you corn husker, right? <laughs> I fell in love so quick, and I fell out of love so quick. And I think that that is the story of many of us with God, many of us with the church. We can get really emotional in a moment, but as life starts to happen, we begin to take what broke our heart at once and put it on the back burner, we lose sensitivity to the reality of the world that we live in. You know, one of the great dangers of a busy world is a calloused heart. And we stop breaking for the things that God's heart breaks for. Do you remember when your heart really broke? When it broke in a way that you will never forget? Like I remember going to Africa or um, to India or Indonesia or Guatemala on, on early mission trips and seeing poverty and just remembering that this isn't right, that this is an injustice and it's shaped me for the entirety of my life. I remember having a moment where I was on this mission trip in Africa and there was this grandma, she had to be 85 years old and she's out in the middle of this village and she's living in this hut and she's literally so immobile that she can't be lifted out of her bed. So she's just like literally just feces all over herself and nobody's caring for her. Nobody's taking care of her. And I remember like feeling like all I want to do is walk out of this house right now because I feel so uncomfortable. I feel so awkward. This is too much for me to take. This would never happen to my grandma. This is not okay. Like what is going on right now? But I just stayed in that moment and allowed my heart to break at the poverty of this world and the brokenness of people. And today I hope that you have one of those moments where you experience and feel and sense the brokenness of this world and you won't just go on with your life but that you will sit in this brokenness and allow your heart to break 
Because if our heart does not break for the brokenness of this world, then we will never rebuild what's been broken. And God has tasked us. God has invited us. God has allowed us to be a part of rebuilding, but we'll never rebuild if first our heart doesn't break. You know, people cry over a lot of things. What are you crying for these days? I hope that you're crying over the same things that God is crying over. I hope your heart is broken by the same things that his heart is broken for. And the scripture says that Nehemiah, that he saw, that he heard, that he got news from the front lines and that he wept. He sat down, he mourned, and he fasted for days. When's the last time? You were broken for days, not broken for the chorus of a song, not broken for a minute, but broken for days over the brokenness of this world. Can I give you some reports from the front lines today? I, uh, I saw this article the other day that said 95% of people are considering quitting their jobs right now, 95%. 95% of people are going, I don't know if I have what it takes to do this anymore. I don't know if I want my life to continue in this trajectory. I feel extremely unfulfilled, extremely detached from purpose. Did you know that suicide rates reached an all-time high during the pandemic? Did you know that antidepressant use is at an all-time high? I don't know about you, but I'm looking at this world that we're living in, and I'm going, how are our 13-year-olds processing this? Like, 14 is hard enough by itself. Can I get an amen? But you add all this in, and what are they doing? What is happening to their minds? What is happening to the minds of a kid who are growing up in this world that we live in? Does your heart break for anything anymore? What is your heart broken by? I hope that your heart breaks for what God hearts breaks for it today. I'm praying that God reminds us of the brokenness in the world and that it breaks our heart. Tell me your heart breaks for something. Tell me it breaks for kids who can't read or kids who have special needs. Tell me it breaks for people who are trapped in addiction, who can't stop looking at pornography, who can't stop going to the bottle, who can't stop going to that pill. Tell me it breaks for the girl who is starving herself just so that she could get a few more followers on Instagram. Tell me it breaks. Tell me it breaks for people who are in homelessness, for people who are in poverty. Tell me it breaks for people who are in Bible poverty, for all of the nations around the world who do not have a copy of God's word translated into their language. They're Bible impoverished. They'll never read the story of Nehemiah. Tell me it breaks for that. Tell me that your heart breaks for the 67,000 people that will be born today in unreached people groups who have no testimony about the risen Christ from me or from you. Tell me it breaks. Tell me it breaks for the refugees who live and are from those unreached people groups who live right down the road in Clarkston, Georgia, but who 87% of them will never be invited into the home of an American or have any testimony about Jesus. Tell me it breaks for that. Tell me it breaks for the unborn children who don't have anybody speaking up for them. Tell me that your heart breaks and that you want to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Tell me your heart breaks for your neighbor who lives less than 100 feet away from you here on earth, but in all of eternity, they will live heaven and earth away in a place called hell because we're not telling them about Jesus because we're so concerned with building our own kingdom that we've lost sight of building the only kingdom that will last. Tell me your heart breaks. Tell me your heart breaks for, man, as I talk to people, people are like, I can't sleep. And I don't know. I don't feel like myself. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where my life is headed. I feel so disconnected. I feel such a lack of joy. I don't know if I could take another lockdown. I don't know if I could take any more division. I don't know if I could take it anymore. Tell me your heart breaks for those people that feel like that they're in ashes, that feel like their life is just a grave and they can't sing that song with us that God turns graves into gardens because we've never told them that he does. Tell me that your heart breaks for the brokenness that we see in this world because until our heart breaks, we'll never rebuild what is broken. You know that sometimes the greatest blessing that God can give you is a burden that you can't shake. 
Sometimes the greatest blessing that God can give you is a burden that you cannot shake. You know, one of the nerdiest things about me is that I've wanted to plant a church since I was 17 years old. That's a nerd, okay? Like no cool 17 year old is like, I wanna be a pastor. <laughs> you know, that's just not like the hot career choice out on the streets, all right? But early on, man, I, I remember growing up and watching church and seeing the demonstration of Christianity here in the Bible Belt and then reading the Bible and going, these two things don't match up. I remember looking at how gracious and loving and audacious Jesus is. And then I remember having experiences where I would go to church or bring a friend to church and somebody would look at the person that I brought because I grew up, man, and I love skating. I was into Jinko jeans. Anybody rock Jinko jeans back in the day? Okay, like you could fit a composition notebook in the back pocket. It was utilitarian, okay? Like, I loved Jingo jeans. I loved to skate, and so, like, my style was wild. The amount of hairstyles that I've had, holy Jesus, okay? Like, I have gone through some phases, but, how, man, I would wear some crazy clothes and hang out with my skater friends, or I, I played basketball, so I'd hang out with my basketball friends, and so I remember one time bringing a group of my friends to church, and literally, like, the whole design of the event at this church was bring your friends to church. Like, the person who brought the most friends to church, one, are you ready for this? A boom box, okay? <laughs> Whoever brought their most friends to church won a boom box. And I was like, I'm gonna bring all my friends to church and win that boom box so that I can listen to Eminem. All right, so that was, that was my heart. So I bring all my friends to church and sure enough, they're kind of dressing like me, wearing their Jinko jeans, got chains, got, you know, just looking crazy, having their skateboards in hands. And we show up to this event and somebody at the church says to my friends, is that your best clothes? Because we wear our best for God here. And it just broke my heart. And I'm like, is this church? Is this what it's supposed to be? Because I feel like Jesus was hanging out with sinners and prostitutes and the most broken and something broke in me that day. I got a burden that day for wanting to build a church for all people, for people from different backgrounds and different races and different colors and different socioeconomic status. And with one, you know, vision for the dress code when it comes to clothes, please wear them, okay? Other than that, just come. Just come. And a burden was created in me that I have not been able to shake that has led us here today. You know that we came here to build Elevate City Church because we're burdened for this generation. For a generation that was sold a cheap version of Christianity that says, just come as you are and you can stay there too. For a version of Christianity that says, you know, what feels right is, is kind of your highest God and the highest ethic in faith. That doesn't prioritize the Bible, that doesn't make disciples, but just attracts attenders. And what we're after, what we're passionate is being a discipleship-driven culture that elevates Jesus above the name of a celebrity pastor or a worship band, but that starts and ends and begins with him. It says, we're just obsessed with Jesus. We just want to know more of Jesus. What is your heart burdened for? What is your heart broken for? I hope that today that maybe you leave burden for single moms or that you leave burden for men who don't know their identity or you leave burden for the poor or you leave burden for the lost. But I believe today that all of us need to leave with a burden, with a burden that feels heavy and that feels urgent. Do you know why? Because when you've got a burden that feels so heavy and so significant and too heavy to carry on your own, do you know where that burden leads you? It leads you to your knees. When you're carrying a burden that is too heavy to accomplish on your own, that feels so urgent, it brings you to your knees. This is what happened to Nehemiah. Nehemiah's burden led him to his knees. He wept and he prayed and he mourned for days. What do you do when you don't know what to do? So many times in life, you find yourself in that situation, I don't know what to do. If you don't find yourself there often, you're not a parent, okay? Because as soon as you become one, you just find yourself consistently in this situation where you're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to discipline. You're probably not married either, okay? I don't know what to do. It is common space I find myself in. A lot of us, man, maybe we go to Google. Maybe we go to a friend. Maybe we... Just do something to push it down. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Maybe you just cry. I'm here to tell you today that if it's big enough to cry about, it's big enough to pray about. 
and it should take you to a posture, it, like the problems in this world that you don't know what to do about, should shift your posture, and it should take you to your knees, like it, so what happened with Nehemiah. What Nehemiah realized is that this burden that he carried was too big for him to do on his own, and that he was going to be powerless without the presence of God. We need some people who recognize that today, that the task that is set before us of reaching our generation, of causing a Jesus movement to awaken is so big that we cannot do it on our own. We can't strategize enough. We can't uh, preach well enough. We can't sing loud enough. We are powerless without the presence of God. And so Nehemiah goes to his knees and he prays. Notice his prayer. Nehemiah chapter one, verse five. And I said, oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. Notice the contents of his prayer. The content of his prayer focuses first on the greatness of God. The greatness of God is the fuel for our fight, amen? That there's nothing that is going to fuel us. Like brokenness is the starting point, but the greatness of God is the fuel for our fight. When he prays, he just starts to brag on God. He starts to see the majesty of God because he understands if we don't see the majesty of God that we'll just be paralyzed by the problem. But Nehemiah is not paralyzed by the problem. He is energized by the possibility because he knows the power of God. He knows the potential of what happens when God gets in our corner. I want for you to know you may feel all alone in your burden today. You may feel all alone in your brokenness today, but you plus God always equals a majority. When God is on your side, you are never in the minority. You've always got more than you need to accomplish what he has called you to. We've got to recognize today that there is no human solution to the problems that we face. We are powerless without the presence of God. That is why Elevate City Church is going to be a movement that is fixated on prayer, that is birthed out of prayer, that believes that the prayers of God's people are the fuel of revival. We're going to be a praying church. Okay, I ain't got no super special, innovative 21st century strategies for you. I've got the strategy that Jesus has been using for the last 2,000 years, and that's his people praying on their knees, asking him to bring heaven to earth. If you know the story of Elevate City, you know that like so many of our events, so many of the things that leading up to launch were just like prayer events. We would just get together and go, hey guys, I don't know what we're gonna do, but we're gonna pray, Okay. And then we're gonna pray some more and pray some more. I mean, there were just days of prayer. And you know, here's the way that prayer works. Is it all, it, when it starts, a ton of people come and by the end, there's a remnant, okay? Because prayer is tough and it is difficult, but it is the work that matters. It is the work that we wanna be engaged in. It is the work of eternity. And so we're gonna actually have a night of prayer tonight at 5 p.m., Church is happening again tonight. We are gonna pray and we are gonna worship and we're gonna fixate our eyes on the greatness of God and tell him that we need him to be the fuel for our fight. We're gonna intercede on behalf of this generation and our city and the brokenness in our world and ask God to build something great and to start it with us. So 5 p.m. tonight, I'm looking for some warriors who wanna come and pray and see God do a great thing in this generation. But we're also gonna to fast too. Nehemiah fasted. If you're new to Bible study, you're new to Christianity, fasting means you don't eat food, okay? We love to be like, I don't do Instagram. That's fasting. That's not fasting, okay? What fasting is, is when you go without, I just want you to know, nobody in the Bible fasted Instagram. Fat, okay? Fat. I know this for certain. Um, and so every time you see fasting in the Bible, in the scriptures, it always involves not eating food. And so on Thursday, this Thursday, we're going to do our first 24-hour fast as a church. Now, that's where you cheer, okay? That's where you get excited that we, for a whole day, I'm asking you to join us in this, to go, I'm not gonna eat food. I'm gonna go without food so that I can have more of God. I'm gonna remove my 
my focus on the material. I'm gonna move my focus on the physical so that my eyes can get connected to the spiritual and so that I can hear from God. And, and literally what we're gonna do for 24 hours, y'all aren't ready for this. This was not my crazy idea, surprise, but um, for 24 hours, there are gonna be members from our team who are on Instagram praying, live Instagram praying, worshiping, dropping truth to encourage you and inspire you to fast and to pray and to seek the face of God for an entire day. Okay, that's what happens when you hire 20-somethings on your staff, okay? They come up with crazy ideas like that. I thought I got out of the lock-in game when I left student ministry behind, all right? But for 24 hours this Thursday, do you know why we're doing this Thursday? This Thursday is 52 days away from our one-year anniversary as a church, from the one-year anniversary of when we started Elevate City. Now, why is that significant? It took Nehemiah 52 days to build the wall. And in 52 days, we believe that God is going to build something here in our church that is strong and that is stable and that, is, that lasts and that is built on the prayers and the fasting of his people. And so I'm just going to invite you in to maybe a spiritual step that you've never taken in your life and just see what God does as we pray tonight and we fast on Thursday. It's going to be epic. I love this quote on prayer, just a little inspiration for you from one of my favorite historical preachers, Leonard Ravenhill. This is what he says. He says, no man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. If we fail to be a church that prays and that prays with seriousness and that prays with focus and that believes that this is our greatest weapon that we have been given as a church, then we are going to fail everywhere. So I wanna invite you, come pray tonight because prayer is absolutely the building blocks of revival. But we're not just gonna pray. We're not just gonna pray for our world to be a better place. We're not just gonna pray that God starts some movement in our church. We're gonna pray that God starts a movement in us because before God ever wants to use us to build something on the outside, he always wants to rebuild every single one of our insides. If you notice in Nehemiah's prayer, the thing that he prays for is he prays for his sin and for the sin of his people. Because when, until we recognize our need from God and our straying away from God, we're never going to be able to lead people back to the heart of God. You know, one of the greatest things that will keep you living on mission for the sake of others is the reminder of how deeply you still need Jesus too. When you remind yourself of the grace that you need for him every single day, you remember the fact that some people have never lived a day with his grace to begin with. And so tonight, man, there's going to be an opportunity for you to be broken, broken by your past and broken by your sin and broken by the ways that you've strayed from God. But there's going to be an opportunity for you to return to his heart, to fixate your eyes and to imagine what he might want to do in you. You know, Nehemiah wasn't just a man of prayer. He was also a man of action. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 11 says something very interesting. It closes out the chapter by saying, now I was a cupbearer to the king. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. Now, if you don't know what a cupbearer is, a lot of the um, definition is in the title of the career, that he, bear, he bore a cup, he carried a cup, but it was so much more than that. He was a servant. He was a servant in um, the king's court, and what he did is he, man, he had lots of jobs of caring for the king's affairs, but one of those jobs had to do with him carrying a cup, and literally what he would do is before the king would eat any food, Nehemiah would try that food because he was trying to make sure that it wasn't poisoned at this time as you can imagine there are many kingdoms that are trying to overthrow the establishment and so what nehemiah is doing is he is making sure that the food that the king is getting ready to eat is not poisoned because if the food is poisoned then nehemiah is out of a job you know what i'm saying 
he's going to die, and so he's going to take one for the king. And so he's got this posture of being a servant, this posture of being sacrificial, this posture of being willing to serve. And, you know, one of the things with today's culture is that we always want it now. We want it right now. We want the end result here today. We want microwaved Christianity, microwaved calling, a microwaved marriage, white microwaved parenting, microwaved finances, microwaved maturity, and it doesn't work that way. You see, a lot of you guys, you haven't been able to build a wall before because you've never carried a cup before. You see, we've got this longing to stand on a stage, but you can't stand on a stage until you carry a cup. You're never going to be able to be a leader unless you're first a follower. You're never going to be able to make significant impact unless you're willing to serve. Do you know what Nehemiah does? Is he becomes the kind of person that's willing to carry a cup. And that's the kind of heart that we want to have as a church. A heart that says that my heart is to serve, to serve people, to serve God's church, to serve the king, to do whatever I can. You see, when you see the brokenness in the world, when you see what's happening in the church, the fact that today... We live at the time in American history where less people go to church than they have in the last hundred years. We live at a time where a lot of new churches aren't being started, but churches that exist are just fighting over Christians that are already there. We're not making new believers. We're just seeing you know, kind of transfer growth. And so then what the temptation becomes is the temptation becomes to have a a scarcity mindset. Well, let's just protect and protect our people and, you know, just build up our own thing. When what we want to have is we want to have a sacrificial mindset that says that we're not about building our kingdom. We're about building the kingdom. We want to see God do something great. We want to serve our city. We want to serve the local church. We want to serve the global church. We want to play our part in this story. This is a time for the heart of service to rise up in the church of Elevate City. You you know that sometimes serving is hard. Like getting here at 6.30 in the morning to set all this up, I want you to know that's not easy breezy, lemon squeezy. Like it takes some effort and some grit, but there's nothing that matters that will not take hard work. And I want for you to know that many hands makes light work. Amen. So this is a season for us as a church to embrace a mindset of being willing to serve, of not asking what can the church do for me, but man, what can I do for my king? And how can I be willing to carry a cup to be a part of what he is building? Your greatest ability. A lot of you, you're wondering right now, like, What does that even mean? What could I even do? Where could I even serve? How could I even be a part? Your greatest ability is always your availability. It is always your willingness to say yes, to go, where do you need me? How can I be a part of this? Help show me, point me, direct me. Now, oftentimes, what you're burdened by is evidence of what you're called to. Your burden, that thing that breaks your heart is oftentimes directing you to where God wants to be use you to make a difference and so pay attention to those burdens but realize that this is a season for all of us to embrace service why because of nehemiah chapter 1 verse 9 because if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven from there i will gather them and bring them to the place that i've chosen to make my name dwell there You see, what God has done is he has built building into the hearts of his people. He used Abraham to build a a family, a nation. He used Moses to to build uh, the law. He used Noah to build a boat. He used the apostles to build his church. He is building his church. He's wired building into us, and it is building season. It is building time. For us to to build something where the name of Jesus dwells and people are drawn to it because his greatness resides there. I see a church that builds a place of radical belonging. I see a church that builds a place where people who are far from God can encounter him in powerful ways. I see a church that stops putting their calling on the shelf and starts to build something back for people who are broken to experience joy. I wanna close today by telling you a story when um, my little girl Raleigh was born, 
my wife, she grew up a dancer. She grew up dancing. Any dancers in the house? Now, it wasn't like, like a dancer, a dancer, like a ballerina, okay? I don't want for y'all to have a negative image of my mind. But she, she, but she grew up dancing, right? And uh, so naturally, when you have a girl, you're like, man, I want my daughter to dance. And, and so I remember when we were in the phase of decorating her room and thinking through all the stuff that we were going to get for when she was born. One of the things that we started searching for was a, uh, a ballerina jewelry box. We wanted her to have this, you know, kind of quintessential ballerina jewelry box that she could put on her dresser and she could put all her little things in and that she could turn and that it would make noise and that the ballerina would dance and you could have all these memories and it would brainwash her into becoming a ballerina later in life. It's what parents do, okay? And so, you know, we searched and we looked and life started to happen and it kind of got put on the back burner. And so Raleigh was born without a ballerina box. What a travesty. And so being the incredible, romantic, amazing, thoughtful husband that I am, when her first Christmas came rolling around, I decided that I was going to go on a hunt for the ballerina box. And so sure enough, I looked to and far, high and low, until I stumbled across Etsy. And on Etsy, that's where y'all say, oh, I found this beautiful ballerina box. And you open it up. Sure enough, it's got the ballerina inside. And on Christmas morning, I had it all wrapped. Kayla had no idea. It was, you know, Kayla and Raleigh, both their name were on the present. And they opened it up. And Kayla saw the ballerina box. And she just starts to cry. And she grabs Raleigh so emotional and this beautiful thing and so then throughout the years you know always sat in Raleigh's room and as she got older you know we would open it up and we would twirl it every night before bed and until one day Raleigh decided she wanted to play with the ballerina box all by herself and what happens when kids get all by themselves is they break things in Jesus name and so Raleigh sure enough she broke the ballerina box she took the little ballerina that spins and she broke it and so I come home from work that day and Raleigh is just distraught and in tears and my ballerina box daddy it broke can you fix it and it was just one of those days where I couldn't get around to it busy from work a call a meeting whatever and I said yeah baby I'll fix it tomorrow tomorrow came and it was another busy day and days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months and Eventually, I, I remember feeling so guilty. Raleigh would ask me, Daddy, Daddy, will you fix my ballerina box? Yeah, yeah, baby, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And eventually, I felt so guilty. <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit it, guys. I put her ballerina box on the shelf in the closet because I was so tired of her asking me the question, Daddy, will you fix my ballerina box? It's broken. Until recently, Raleigh brought her ballerina box downstairs and she said, Daddy, I need you to fix my ballerina box. And don't you know that one of the great graces of God is opportunity. And the fact that sometimes that you have to seize opportunity in the lifetime of that opportunity. And that opportunity of her placing it right in front of me with me having nothing to do made me me forced my hand where I had to go and fix that ballerina box. So I go into the garage and start to do the things necessary to be able to fix the ballerina box and get the ballerina all situated and get it all working and open it up for the first time in front of her. And she just starts to lose her mind, right? Put my little baby girl up there on the screen. Just look at that face. Look at that face of her as a ballerina, just so precious, so in love, so fascinated. And she starts to twirl and she starts to be so joyful and so happy and so glad. And, and so now every night her ballerina box sits on her dresser. And what does she ask? Dad, can we, can we spin the ballerina? Dad, can we, can we open the jewelry box? Every night she wants to do this. All because I seized the opportunity that was right in front of me to build what was broken. And I'm just here asking if there's anybody in the house today 
who wants to seize the opportunity that's right in front of you to build what's broken. Not so that every night somebody's life could be different, but so that all of eternity life could be different and people's lives could be marked by joy and dancing and freedom of knowing their heavenly father. We want to be the kind of church that is willing to build the kingdom brick by brick. And so today's different. We're going to sing a little bit in just a minute, but we're going to do a whole lot of business with God. We've got these bricks that are up here, the front of the auditorium. And during worship, I want to give you an opportunity to come to the front and I want for you to grab one of these bricks because you believe that you're a brick, that your life is a brick and that there's a step that you need to take as a brick. And during worship, there are going to be um, people who pass you out markers and there are gonna be some prayers that we've written as a church that we want to invite you to pray with us over this series. And we're gonna ask you to take this brick home today. And we're gonna ask you to put this brick somewhere that you can't not look at it today. Somewhere that is an opportunity for you to see every single day that you cannot avoid. And we want for you over the course of this eight week series on Nehemiah to every single day pray the prayer that you write on this brick and remind yourself of what God wants to use and build in you and through you. And then at the end of the series, eight weeks from now, we're gonna ask every one of you to bring this brick that was sitting on your dashboard or on your coffee table or on your bedside table or on your desk at work. We want for you to bring it back. And on the other side, we're gonna write the story of God's faithfulness of what happens when his people pray, amen? And so let me give you a picture of these prayers. We got five prayers that we're praying as a church. We wanna invite you into praying these with us. And it's gonna be so cool that hundreds of people are gonna be praying these prayers. Here they are, prayer number one, a glimpse of glory. If that's you, you're gonna write it on the brick, a glimpse of glory. Join us in praying that we would see the greatness and glory of God in ever increasing measure this year. We wanna be a church obsessed with the awesomeness of God. You just write that, a glimpse of glory. Maybe that's not you, maybe it's day by day. And day by day, you write that. Join us in praying for 365 people to be baptized this year. Anybody excited to be about a church that wants to see 365 people baptized this year? We wanna be an everyday missional movement just like the early church where lost people are getting found, broken people are being made whole and dead people are coming alive day by day. But it's not just day by day. And the next prayer, kingdom culture. Join us in praying for the most all in expression of church we've ever experienced. We wanna see more people lead, serve the now gen, read the Bible in a year, go through base camp, get equipped, experience community, go on mission, give and make disciples than ever before. Kingdom culture. Fourth prayer is this, five in five. This is exciting, y'all. Join us in praying for five Jesus-centered, discipleship-driven, transformation-focused churches in five years. We want to be a movement that multiplies to the ends of the earth. Sandy Springs, Metro Atlanta, Nicaragua, Belgium, and in a prison, y'all. God behind bars. And then finally, a place to call home. Join us in praying that God would gift us a home base for kingdom expansion, generational transformation, and community impact. We want to be a church with roots in this community to see the kingdom come in Sandy Springs as it is in heaven. Who would love to stop doing portable church and get a building, a place to call home to impact this community? We want you to join us in praying. So I believe that God is working today. I believe that some bricks are getting built today. I believe that some steps need to get taken today because you're broken and burdened by the broken world that we live in and you wanna join God in building his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And we thank you that you take broken people who've got broken stories, who feel like there are broken places in their soul and in their heart but who know that you meet us in those broken places and you make us whole, you make us brand new, you rewrite our story, you invite us in, you give us your love 
and you set us on mission. And so God, I'm just praying that the church of Jesus would rise up today, that some brick layers would get built today, and that the kingdom would come today on earth as it is in heaven. And prayed in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Hey, thanks so much for engaging with this message today. My prayer is that you're leaving today with your life looking a little bit more like Jesus. Before you go, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And remember, if you wanna see this content get in front of more people, you can always partner with us by giving to the ministries of Elevate City Church. And there's a link for you to do that below. Hope you have an incredible day. Be blessed.